Joining us now, she's the head coach of Mississippi State, fresh off a year where they win 35 wins, got to regional final in the NCAA tournament. I speak of our good friend Samantha Ricketts back with us here on In the Circle. Uh, coach, it's good to talk to you about a full, you know, after a full season for a change. Yes, not after being cut off halfway through. I, I agree. I will take it. <laughs> What has it been like? Uh, I mean, it's been you know unique. I don't think there was a playbook for how to describe your first couple of years as a head coach. When you go back to 2020, you had a great season going on that got abruptly ended. And then last season, you get off to a slow start. There's obviously protocols everybody's dealing with. Uh, people are wondering. You're on the bubble for most of the year. But then you go on a this torrid pace at the end of the year where not only you make the tournament, but you make a run to the regional final before losing a really good Oklahoma State team. Just when you kind of look back here your first couple of years, what have you what have you taken from your first two years, a couple of years here as head coach? Oh, man. Um, really, it's just it's been a whirlwind. And I think the biggest thing is that, you know, we talk to our players all the time that the game can be taken away in an instant. And now we've all lived that. And so really, I just think of, you know, really just grateful for the opportunities every day to be out there to to be able to lead this team to have the opportunities that I have to, you know, to lead them in the opportunities they have. Um, I think really has been the biggest thing that I've learned through this all is that I can't control what's going to happen every single day, no matter how much I want to and I want to plan it and do it, you know, just like I'm doing a practice plan. Um, but I think that's been the biggest thing is just appreciate every day that we have together and, you know, let it be fun. And I think that was a big message that came up this spring for us as well. And I think we started to put a lot of pressure on ourselves after the way we finished 2020. Um, you know, and we went in just with all these expectations for ourselves, and the game really wasn't fun anymore. And we really weren't getting the opportunity. We weren't really playing the way that we used, that we liked to. We didn't get the chance to do a lot of team meals, team activities, things that we knew set us up for success. Well, with a lot of the COVID rules early on. and you know, as we got later into the spring in 2021, it was like, let's just relax. Let's go back. You know, we didn't suddenly learn how to hit or pitch or play defense. We just went back to who, what made us good. And that was enjoying softball and enjoying being around each other. And I think that's kind of the overall message that we all had to learn kind of the hard way, but luckily in enough time this spring, um, after the year that we've had. I mean, was it, I mean, I remember it was the South Carolina series where it's things started to turn around. Was it was there a meeting? Was somebody say something? Like what cha- What flipped the switch? Oh man, there, there were a lot of meetings. Um, you know, that's what <laughs> happens. But it really, it happened before that. You know, I thought we played um, really well two weekends before that at Arkansas. You know, we just ran into a really great Arkansas team. Um, but it was, you know, credit to the players, they never once packed it up and said, oh, you know what, there's always next year. It was how, what can we do? How can we get better? How can we work harder and still enjoy what we're doing, even when we're not getting the results. Um, so I'd say that Arkansas series was probably the, the start of the turnaround a little bit. You know, we had some moments, Missouri, Arkansas, um, and then AM, where we, um, I think we took that Saturday game from them was kind of the start of it. And then getting to South Carolina, it was finally just like another, let's play loose, have fun, have our play our game and just kind of got them on a roll. And once they got started, there was just no stopping them. What's the biggest thing you'll take away from last year? Maybe something you learn as a coach, you kind of will either use or adapt or, or, or something you'll keep in mind in future years or something you're like, yeah, I'm not going to do that again. What, what, what do you take from 21 that'll help you uh, this year, next upcoming year beyond? I think just that, you know, it changes from year to year, even though the majority of our team from last year returned from 2020, it was a totally different group and dynamic and, you know, just learning how to adapt to each team year by year, I think uh, was a good lesson. And then also just, you know, not to try, I mean, we talk about this with our girls, to use your people, use the resources, use people around you that are, that want to help, that want to be there for you. And, you know, for us, that was different departments on campus, whether it was sports psychology, um, you know, our nutritionists, everyone just kind of pitching in to let's really focus in and do what we can, um, which is stuff we've done in the past. But I think you know, even outside of the program, Coach Gasso was one person that I talked to a lot throughout that. She was like, hey, what are we doing here? You know, what's going on? And just a good resource for me. And I think for me, that was a good message is use the people in your corner, trust trust them, and don't try and do everything yourself all the time. 
And you had, you know, it really was an incredible finish. You went 10 and three, your last 13 games. I remember you swept Georgia uh, in the end of the regular season. You beat Tennessee. I mean, you were playing some of the best softball there. You beat Ole Miss in the SEC tournament. And then you get to Stillwater. You beat very good Boston team. You beat Campbell. And you, you know, you were, you ran into a, you know, Oklahoma State team that obviously proved themselves getting the Women's College World Series. What did you, what did you take from that postseason experience as a head coach? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And I think, you know, we were very confident and still playing loose, knowing that that was had what was what got us there. And, you know, that run that we went on the end of the year, Um, you know, I think the biggest thing we learned is just continuing to enjoy it and enjoy every game that we play and go out there and compete and not really worry about the results because that wasn't always something we were going to be able to control. And, you know, I think we we did that in that Georgia series in the midweek doubleheader against Tennessee. um, And then really were able to do that going out the rest of the way in Oklahoma State, you know, Carrie Eber- Eberly and then their offense was just a tough one to run into, but it was, it was a good experience. I think to get back there to get postseason experience for my younger core group that didn't have the opportunity in 2020, I think that was a big part of it. And, you know, for them to be in that environment, to see uh, the fan base in Stillwater, I think was a big part of it as well. And, you know, I think just continuing to grow our program and to see what Kenny's done at Oklahoma state is really kind of, inspiring for for me for our staff and something that we look up to so you know our girls are looking around like man we want we want to do this we want to host we want to have the support from the community because they're very similar college towns um so for us it was just enjoying that enjoying the moment enjoying the opportunity to be out there and then really you know locking in on what our focus was and that's to get back there and for that to be an everyday an every year thing for us as well so now you get to the fall, and obviously, it, you know, you lose some great players, including, I mean, she go, you know, you know you're a big deal, a big name when people just know you as Fa. <laughs> yes. All right? And, and we don't need to say anything more, but she hit 343, 20 homers, 48 RBS. Before we get into who you have, let's talk about who you lost, because that group was pretty special to you, I know, especially the, the impact they left on the program. Yes, for sure. We're going to miss all of them. Um, you know, Fa, Lou, obviously, are all American hitter that just really put us on her back for a lot of the season, you know, and, you know, she's getting into coaching now and I'm just really excited to see what she's going to be able to do out on the other side of it. But, you know, you don't replace a FA, not, not with that type of production. You just, you know, try to build up around her and hope that you can get multiple players to replace some of those offensive numbers she put up. Um, you know, same thing with Carter Spexarth and Emily Williams uh, deciding not to take their fifth year. Those are two impact players for us that played a lot of games. Um, you know, so them, and then we graduated Alyssa Loza and Christian Quinn as well. So it was a really good veteran core group for us. Um, but it's been fun. You know, we still have Alyssa Loza on staff as our graduate assistant, and it's been fun to see the next group kind of that learned under them now step up. I think Chloe Mwaulu is a huge piece of that. And, you know, she's not yet a senior, but really kind of even through this past spring when we're you know, in the middle of that slump at the beginning of SEC play, Chloe was one of the big leaders that stepped up. Um, and so it wasn't everybody just looking to Fa, just looking to Quinn or to Alyssa, but, you know, to have Chloe in the middle of all that too was really, I think, a good starting point for this year and something that we can build off of that leadership that, that she showed for us and for the team, even through, you know, the highs and the lows that we did. So it sounds like you've already got some established leaders even coming from the coming out of this fall is that accurate you've got some leaders already established because sometimes you have to it evolves a little bit but it sounds like you've already got some leaders kind of lined up it it does evolve and it's something that we continue to work on and we don't really want it to just be one person i think that's a lot of pressure um you know but we work on a lot of leadership skills off the field just like we're working on you know softball skills on and you know chloe's one that i think a lot of people can relate to um, you know, she's learning kind of the tough love side of leadership as well. And I think she's got a good supporting cast. Mia Davidson, um, you know, is also a great leader, really by example, too. And she's learning to use her voice more. And you know, when your best player is one of your top leaders, I think that's going to be really special for us. Um, so it's been fun to see them speak up and really even our freshmen, our freshmen, our transfers, they're not afraid to talk, um, which is something that isn't always the case on teams and it changes year by year. So just kind of grooming them for the, them to take on that leadership role, whether it's as a sophomore, junior, senior, I think we're starting to see that up and down this lineup. And that's probably the biggest difference I've noticed this fall um, is just the core group, really just the chemistry of them, the culture of the locker room just seems really enjoyable and something that's something we've been working hard to get to. 
you mentioned Mia Davidson. She might be got a little bit under the radar because you know you're playing with Fa. Fa gets a lot of the attention, but she had 311, 17 homers, 42 RBIs. Talk about her. What makes her such a great player and what she brings to the table? And she obviously will help lead the offense. Yes, Mia is you know probably best all around athlete on our team. She could play anywhere, and she kind of has. Um, we had two shortstops go down within the first week of the season in February this past year. So Mia played the first month of the year at shortstop, you know, and she's a catcher by trade. So, but that's just how good she is. She knows the game at such a high level that you, even though she was a little bit uncomfortable, um, you know, it really didn't, it didn't affect her too much. And, you know, we love having her out there. I could put her at third, first, second catch. Um, I haven't put her in the outfield yet, but she's begging for a shot. But really just, you know, it's fun to have an athlete like that, that can go wherever, that knows the game. She's really an extension of myself and the coaching staff. You know, she knows kind of that next level, high level thinking, whether it's a plan in the box or what's going on with the pitchers or on defense. And so for her to be able to, you know, voice that and kind of be an extension of us, whether it's in the cages or in a game is so helpful. You know, I can turn around, um, be working with one hitter in a cage. I'll have DJ Sanders working with another hitter in the cage next to me. And then Mia's in the third cage, you know, she gets her reps in and then she grabs a freshman and starts working with her. Um, and it's just really fun to watch. She's another one. I think that's going to really be a, a great coach one day. Um, if that's the path she decides to take, because, you know, it's not just because she's talented and it comes easy to her, but it's because she wants to share and to teach as well. Who are some of the other players on offense to look for uh, the people that Bulldog fans will be looking at in the here once the season gets going? Yeah, I think we're going to have a, a strong group. You know, we've got a couple of key returners. Um, Madison Kennedy's healthy. She was one of the shortstops that went down uh, early in the year and really wasn't 100% until May, until we went on that run. And she was a big part of that. Um, but I think, you know, she's going to help offensively behind Mia. Chloe Malalulu is always a steady presence for us there. Um, you know, we've got couple others battling in the outfield for spots, Bradley St. Clair, Kiki Edwards, um, Montana Davidson in the infield with some of the newcomers. And I think really that's going to be a fun battle is to see some of these newcomers work in. Um, Jackie McKenna is another one. I think that can step up a little bit. She had some power for us last year, ended up hitting the middle of the lineup um, and had some big key hits for us. So I'm excited to see her in the, in our offense again. But really, I think the two transfers are going to be the two new names to, um, to really watch out for. It's going to be Shea Moreno um, from Seminole State Junior College. She was the National Junior College Player of the Year last year. Um, and she's just athlete, hit for average, hit for power. She can run. She can play defense. Um, she's definitely going to be in there. And then Mata, Matalasi Fa'apito, um, another Samoan name for us in Starkville. But our transfer from New Mexico State just – really is going to help patch, uh, you know, a lot of the home runs and the extra base hits that we lost from Fawn from Carter and big power, big time swing. She could also pitch a little bit for us, but I think she'll definitely be a staple for us in the lineup to protect Mia as well. By the way, your team should be used on the spelling bee sometimes. I mean, that, <laughs> I know. I mean, that's pretty good. I've seen Matalasi in person. Uh, mm -hmm. And that stood out to me when I saw that she was coming to your place. I've seen her in prison. I've seen her swing the bat, but I've seen her, as you mentioned, she could pitch. Uh, and she's been, you know, she's used to winning. Uh, do you look for two-way players? Is that just something that happens? Obviously, uh, you know, the Ricketts name, there's a, fam a famous two-way player in the family there <laughs> to quite a little bit. Uh, so just talk because I'm really fascinated by her and I'm really looking forward to seeing how she fits there uh, with your team. Yeah, we, you know, we love a pitcher that can hit and it's something, you know, that we've looked for in recruiting. We also have Addison Purvis who can do a little bit of both as well. Um, you know, when I first got to Mississippi State, we had Alexis Silkwood. And, you know, it's fun to be able to, you can use them in a lot of different matchups. And I think that's really where Mata um, is going to fit in well for us this year. You know, I think the years of really riding the one horse pitcher all the way through are kind of gone. Um, you see a lot of teams moving towards that pitching staff approach. That's something we like to do, whether it's using an opener, a closer, middle relief, a lefty specialist, um, kind of more baseball esque in that sense. But she could definitely fit in that role. And the fact that she'll be in the lineup makes it easy because she could come in in the third and again in the seventh. Um, and you're right. She's absolutely a competitor and she is used to winning. She's used to having the ball. You know, she knows that she's probably not going to see the same amount of innings here that she saw at New Mexico State. Um, but she's OK with that. She wants to win. She wants to compete. And, 
you know, she's kind of a mix of Fa and Sarai New, two of our previous uh, Samoan players that we've had. And you know, she's big, she's strong, she's competitive, she's fiery, but she's also really goofy and sweet. And you, I don't think you would notice that when you're looking at her on the mound, because um, that's a, she's a big intimidating presence. But we're excited for her to continue to grow in this program. I think, um, you know, one of the things she does really well is just hit her spots and she's going to get ground ball after ground ball, soft contact and get us out of some jams. Um, so I definitely look for her in that role as well as hitting, you know, behind Mia or in front of her, you know, somewhere very close to the top of the lineup for us. When you have either a freshman coming in or a transfer coming in, you know, as far as the offense is concerned, how do you approach them from a teaching standpoint? Because they're probably have their own way of hitting they've probably been taught a certain way do you kind of kind of pick their brain to see do you work with them do you how do you kind of work with them because on the one hand there's certain things you probably want them to do but at the other on the other hand you don't want to do too much to them where they it gets kind of confusing for them yeah it is always um you know a little bit of balance and you have less time with them than you would with a freshman coming in who's also you know going through that transition but I think a big thing that we do right off the bat is we evaluate everyone, you know, returners and the newcomers, the transfers, and, you know, we're going to put them through tests in the weight room, uh, mobility screenings with our athletic trainer, um, hitting and pitching. And we just get all their numbers. We test them for about a week and a half, two weeks, see where they're at. And then we start the conversations of, okay, how do we improve on these? Where do we go from here? And I think that's a big part of what we do um, is, you know, really that player development focus. And it is a lot of conversations, you know, coach uh, Josh Johnson didn't hop in with Mata in the bullpen and say, okay, we're doing X, Y, Z. It's what do you do? What do you like? How does this work? All right. Now, how can we improve on it? And then having the numbers and the data to back that up, I think is where we kind of start in that development piece after we finish testing. Um, Same thing in the cages, you know, she gets in and the bat speed, the exit velo is, clearly there. That's not something that we're going to need to touch, but it's all right. Now, how do we make you better? What did you struggle with? What's something you want to work on? And then, you know, through our testing, we can see, all right, maybe we need to work on this location or hitting this speed a little bit better. And we have different approaches and ideas where we can enhance or leave her, you know, kind of let her be with what she's good at and then work up the the skills around that for her. Your pitching staff will be led by Annie Willis, who really came on 17 wins last year, 292 ERA. A kid that I saw as well, Aspen uh, Wesley, kind of gave you some good moments, innings there, five and four. Just talk about your staff. You lose Williams, obviously, who uh, was a big part of your staff, but you do have some arms there. Just talk, how do you feel about your staff here? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm excited. I think, like you said, Aspen Wesley is going to be a huge piece in replacing Emily Williams. She's really came on strong, you know, gave us some good innings there down the stretch in the spring and has looked great this fall. I think her and Annie are really kind of 1A and 1B and, you know, it could be either or at either time. And they're just really great at, you know, great supporters of each other, of the team. They're each other's biggest cheerleaders, which is always nice when you, those, the leaders, your pitching staff are like that too. You know, they want to see the other one succeed. They want to help them out um, and really, you know, bring different looks. Annie's tall, you know, throw the ball up in the zone and really locate it well, where Aspen's thrown from a completely different arm slot. She's about um, you know, maybe five, three. So she's coming from down low and she can mix and she's added a couple pitches to her repertoire as well. Uh, so excited for the two of them to mix and match, you know, and I think we've got some good supporting casts around them when we're using that, that pitching staff approach. Um, Mata, obviously, and then uh, Grace Fagan, our lefty, uh, you know, we're hoping for you know, kind of a breakout year from her. She's got some, some great stuff as well. And I don't think she's really shown it yet. Um, but she's one, I think that could come in and give us some good innings as well as freshman, um, Bree Bauer. She had a little bit of a illness, you know, this fall that held her back a little bit, but she's, she's going to be really good, especially moving forward. I think she'll get a lot of innings early on, just kind of getting her some experience, um, you know, and see how she does before we get to SEC play. But I think she's definitely one of the arms of the future for us. And then probably the other one, Kenley Hawk, you know, really excited about her. She's been in the program now for three years and just really has worked and worked and developed. And there's kind of just been this switch that's clicked with her this year where she's mature. She's, she just all kind of figured it out. And she's going to be a little, a, a different look than the rest of our pitchers. She throws hard and down and drop balls and she gets a ton of ground balls to our infield. Um, and, you know, to be able to mix and match her with Aspen and Annie who are more up in the zone. 
I think is going to be huge for us. But you know, we've got them, we've got Mata and, and Addison who can come in and spots as well. So I think we'll see a lot of shuffling around, but that's what we like to do. Some versatility in that staff. I mean, I've yes. seen Mata start and come in relief, for example. Do you have that versatility? And, you know, I know Coach Johnson handles the pitching staff. Do, do you want to have set roles for your pitching staffs? Do you kind of kind of keep it wide open? What's kind of the approach on handling the staff? Because you mentioned you have to have a staff. Uh, mm-hmm. Some coaches like to have defined roles for them. Some don't. Some kind of like just to see, you know, go with hot hands and not have defined roles. What's the philosophy with your staff? Yeah, it's really just an open line of communication with that. Like there definitely are defined roles, but they might change week to week. Um, But they're going to know going into a weekend. All right. You know, you're getting the start here. You're going one time through the lineup. And then I want to get to, you know, we're bringing the next pitcher, maybe in the third inning. And then we're looking for you if she's in trouble. And this one, if if in relief to close. Um, So they know the plan going in. They're prepared for that. And it does, it changes, I think, based on how they do. Alyssa Loza was a great example of that. Um, in 2020, she was specifically being used as what we call an opener. So she'd throw one time through the lineup, everybody would see her once, and then she would get her out. And that was really what set her up for success. You know, she, her, the numbers showed that she got hit a lot harder the second time through. Um, so we used her in that type of situation. And then this past year, her senior season in 2021, she really just took that role and ran with it and earned herself a much bigger role. She became kind of the closer and she'd come in in like the fourth or fifth inning and go two times through the lineup. And, you know, also got some starts, had some big wins for us um, against Georgia, against Tennessee and some others. And you just, she understood where her role was. She absolutely dominated it. And then that earned her a bigger spot. And she really did a great job with that this season as well. Let's talk about your staff. Uh, obviously, Tyler, you go way back with Tyler. You've been working together for a long time, Tyler Braden. Of course, Josh Johnson, you hired a couple of years ago. You've added DJ Sanders as a volunteer. Just talk about your entire staff. Uh, as, as, you know, kind of because you all kind of getting used to working with each other as well. So how talk about your staff. Yeah, you know, I think our staff really does a great job of working together. I think we all have that approach and that mindset of, you know, player development being at the forefront of what we're doing. Um, and you know, that comes down to our recruiting, to what we're doing in the weight room and the cages. And it's just really a collaborative effort between the coaching staff, the strength and conditioning staff, the nutritionist, the athletic trainer, like we're all in that together with the same common goal. And so that's something we really try to keep the focus on. And I think we do a good job of that, but you know, Josh handles our pitchers. He also, uh, works with the catchers and, you know, does a lot of stuff with Mia Davidson and you know, the other young catchers behind her, which I, we think really we've seen a great improvement on as well. You know, we've, um, I think we had the most strikeouts looking last year. And I think that's a different approach to the receiving and the work that Mia and Jackie were doing for us behind the dish last year. Um, also does a lot of our overhand throwing. And then he's the big data guy. He's the nerd with all the numbers and he's <laughs> the one that we go to. Um, you know, Hey, what do you see? What's something? And he's got us all set up with athlete engineering, which is a department on campus where he's working on his PhD. So, you know, it's great to have one thing that was important to me is just having people that have different strengths. Um, and so to have someone like that, that I can trust with all the numbers and is going to be able to help me out and be in my ear on any of that is huge. And then coach Bratton kind of on the other side, he's going to be the big energy hype man you know, where I'm more the steady kind of even keeled coach and approach with the, with the hitters. Um, he helps with the hitters. He's taken on a bigger role this year with the defense. He's taken the infield um, as well as an outfield and myself and DJ just kind of assist there, but um, really been great. Yeah. I've been with him for a long time here at Mississippi state. Now he was a huge piece um, this fall, especially our director of operations transition. And we went three weeks without one. And I was really lost. You know, I didn't really know how a lot of that stuff worked without a director of ops. And he stepped in, you know, took on a lot of extra jobs and was just a huge help in that, in that um, time that we were kind of in transition. But um, yeah, you know, he's going to be the one getting the circle, hype the girls up, you know, big energy and, you know, brings it at third base as well. So it's fun to have that balance for us where we're all so different, but we understand we're all working for the same goal. And then DJ is our newest one and DJ, you know, really excited about her. I think she's going to be a great young coach. Um, You know, she's still new, she's still learning, but man, if she isn't just one of the most detail oriented hitting instructors I've ever seen. And she's not afraid to get in there 
with a kid and try things and, you know, get them to understand that it's okay to fail. It's okay to swing and miss. And when she talks about that's what she did when she started out, it kind of becomes a little bit more okay for them. You know, they all remember watching her play. They don't remember watching me play. I'm too old now. Um, but she's just, she's been awesome. You know, she comes from that Mike Latif school of hitting and I learned a lot from her too. It's fun to see, you know, the way she looks at a swing and swing mechanics, um, and approach and just, you know, who she's had the opportunity to learn from her, from Mike, from Chris Malbone out Tennessee. Um, it's been fun to kind of help her get started in her coaching journey as well. And she's, you know, she's a Mississippi kid. She's 30 minutes down the road from us. Um, you know, she told me when she came on that she would have come to Mississippi state for free and out of high school. I'm like, oh, don't tell me that, but you know, we're just, we're glad to have her. I'm glad she's finally a maroon is finally a bulldog, but i um, really excited about adding her to our staff. And I know our hitters love her as well. Yeah, she's still playing at a high level, uh, which I'm sure the players are aware that they see that when they see her at Athletes Eliminate and things like that. How important is it for you to help a DJ Sanders and others that you've had to not only, obviously, they're going to help you and your program, but help them for their next chapter, whatever that is. We just had Christy Breadbenner, uh, who has Nicole Pendley as the director of ops. She says she's the best director of ops she's ever had and gave you credit for kind of, you know, setting her up to being her prepared. Uh, how important is that to you to help in others get in the game? Yeah, I think, um, you know, ultimately that's the goal for the players, for the staff is to set them up for success when they leave your program. And, you know, it's only four years. Uh, what, you know, for DJ, you don't know how long it is in a coaching role, but it's four years. And are they leaving just with skills they learned on the field or for skills off, off the field as well? And that's communication skills. You know, do they know how to have a tough conversation how to write a professional email? Um, you know, just all the kind of little things. And those are things that we preach to the players um, as well as to DJ. And I think she learns a lot from being put in the situations, just kind of thrown into the fire. So, all right, DJ, you got the hitters today, take them and run. And she kind of looks at me the first time like, you'll be fine. You, I trust you. You got it. Um, but that's really what's exciting is to see them kind of grow and to to trust their skills and to continue to t like trial and error. And I think that's the best way to learn. That's how I did. Uh, you know, Christy Breadbenner was a huge part of why I'm here as well. And you know, she had a big part in my, in my development as a young coach. So, you know, it's fun to, to now kind of be on the other side and to help bring up another young one. Um, and that's important. And, you know, with having two male assistants, I also want to make sure that I'm looking out for young females of the sport and, you know, DJ Alyssa Loza as our GA, um, you know, that's important for us and what we're doing. And when we're looking to, for young coaches to bring in and what can they bring for the program, but it's also, what can we do for them? How can we help them in their journey as well? Yeah. You mentioned coach Breadbender, you were an assistant of hers for three seasons from 12 to 14, had a lot of success at Wichita. I think a lot of people that maybe don't follow the sport on day to day, you know, associate you rightfully so with coach Gasso as part of the Gasso tree. But what did you learn from coach Breadbender? Cause uh, you had success there and that helped you get uh, eventually to Mississippi state. Yeah, Christy was, um, she was great. I mean, really learned a lot from her. And really, it was kind of that trial by error approach of, all right, you're going to be in charge of this, this and this, figure it out, ask me <laughs> questions along the way. And not that she wasn't there to help, but just she put a lot of expectations on you. Um, and really, you know, she used to give me a hard time because I would ask, well, how do we you know, get the equipment or the field done all this, you know, all these people, all the support staff that we had at OU. And she just looked at me and said, you do that. And I think it was a great start for a young coach because at the time we didn't have a director of operations. We didn't have those support staff that she now has um, now that she's gotten it at Wichita State. But, you know, I had to take on a lot of roles and jobs that I never even really knew. I didn't know how it how that was all operating when I was at Oklahoma because, because of the support staff we had there. And, you know, she's grown and with her success, she's gotten a lot of new positions, which has been great. But at the time, you know, it was really just the three of us in the office and kind of grinding together like all right you're going to be part-time academic counselor part-time video coordinator equipment and you're working with the hitters and like, okay okay we, we got this but you know really just appreciated her guidance and leadership and trust in me through all of it I think that was a big part of it um, and you know it was just always there to answer questions along the way and help me in that journey and it sounds like it helped you kind of be a, a adapt and also you, you said, I feel like you as a coach like to have input, like different ideas. You mentioned you like DJ and her, what she's learned uh, from her playing days. You, a lot of coaches sometimes like to have their own style, but you seem to 
like to kind of pick brains and, and take some other, you know, approaches as well and listen to some other ideas and pretty open. Is that fair to say? Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, once, once you think, you know, it all as a coach, then you're in trouble. And, you know, I think our, our game is constantly adapting and changing. And so trying to keep up and learn from others who might have a different perspective or opinion than you is always a good thing. And that's why, you know, things like the NFCA convention were great because you can hear from different perspectives. Um, and then for me, I think a lot of that too started at OU um, and having two very different hitting coaches. You know, I started with Howard Dobson, who's now at LSU for two years, uh, was the hitting coach for, for Oklahoma. And then when he left, uh, Trip McKay, who's now at Kennesaw State, came in. So played for both of them for two years each, uh, stayed on for two years as a GA with Coach McKay, and then, you know, just got to learn the two different styles. And for me, I think that's kind of where it started was Coach Dobson was really about, you know, what works best for each hitter individually and, you know, tr the trial and error approach. While Coach McKay, I really learned the swing mechanics and how the body worked. And so for me, it's always just been fascinating because I had success under both and was able to take a little bit from both of them. And then even moving on, I think the way I taught hitting early on at Wichita State is not the same way I would teach it now today. And you are continuing to learn, continuing to adapt, to learn from others out there. You know, there's a lot of different classes and courses and even just stuff that people post for free, um, you know, on Twitter are always really interesting to look at just different ideas and videos, um, articles that you could find um and yeah being able to learn from dj and the way that mike latif taught the swing you know we had lexi elkins as a ga or as our volunteer assistant in 2019 and i think that's what really kind of started piquing my interest just with that approach and the way they learned was you know being able to work with lexi um and then that really kind of sparked hey let's try and get dj back here now and really enjoyed both of them um you know i've been on the phone with coach latif a couple times but you're just one of the best to do it in a completely different way. And now that we've got kind of the resources to, to test those approaches and to get into the athlete engineering lab and see how the body works and how can we improve on that with the swing, with the pitching, um, has been fun. And it's something I think we're pretty new into in softball and in, even in our research and what coach Josh is doing with the pitchers and the athlete engineering lab, but it's something that helps to push the game forward, helps to make it better. And that's ultimately our, one of the goals that we're working towards as well. You've always seen the like hitting. Is that what kind of got you interested in coaching? You wanted to coach hitting, just learning, you know, Coach Dobson. You mentioned Coach McKay. I mean, that's two of the best right there. Mine's there. Of course, Coach Gasso has to be influential in you getting into coaching. How can you not uh, there? But I mean, I feel like you would be coaching hitting no matter what than today. I feel like you would be that that was you were going to be involved one way or the other. Yeah, that's always just really been my passion within the game. You know, I do, I love defense. I love everything else about it, but, you know, hitting is what, what I was good at. And it wasn't something that I was naturally good at. You know, if you ask coach Dobson, my freshman year at OU, I didn't hit a ball out of the infield, you know, and it was a struggle. And, you know, I really had to work hard to be a great hitter. And it was every game, every practice, I did a lot extra um, and I wanted to know everything. If the pitcher was going to tip a pitch with her pinky, I wanted to know. And, you know, in some ways, Mia Davidson is a lot like that. I think that's why we really get along well in that, you know, hitting coach hitter relationship, because she kind of thinks along that same wavelength. Um, but for me, that's always just been the interesting part. It wasn't something that just came naturally. Uh, I had teammates like that, that it did. They just, you know, I'd ask, what'd she throw you? Is that a curveball? I'm like, I don't even know what a curveball is. And it just, it was so frustrating to me. But to have, I think, just that that level of work and research into it and know what it did for me to put in the extra time there, I think, has really kind of sparked that interest and in why I continue to put an extra time to, to keep learning and finding out everything I can um, about the swing. But yeah, it's fun. I enjoy it. I don't get to do as much of it now in the head coach role. Um, and that's where having someone like DJ really comes in handy, you know, because there are some days where I have to go be director of ops or I have to go be head coach and where you're just kind of in and out and having somebody you can trust um, and really have a good conversation and relationship with. It's never her way or my way. It's let's collaborate. We're going to talk about it beforehand. All right. We want to work on X, Y, Z with just this hitter with this group of hitters. And it's something that I trust her completely to do if I'm not in there the whole time while she's working with the hitter. What's the one thing that hitters have today or something that you make sure hitters have or know now that you wish you knew when you were playing? Ooh, that's a big one. <laughs> um, 
I think the biggest thing, especially that transition from high school to a college hitter is to really have a plan, you know, the pitch, the pitching is so much better. And when they come in without any sort of, well, I don't know, I'm just going to look for something good and hit it. Well, you're probably already going to be beat. Um, you know, just to have a plan to know what you're going to get, what she throws, what her setup pitches might be having a plan with two strikes, having a plan with a change of speed. You know, what are you doing when you're looking change up versus fastball? Um, I think that's the biggest thing that I've learned over the years. And that's really helped me help our hitters and, um, something that maybe it took me a little bit too long to learn as a hitter myself. Talking about your schedule, uh, let me just start with the opening weekend. It's a wow. You're going to be part of the Mark Campbell Invitational, uh, which is cool. Great, awesome person, influential person in softball. You're going to play Loyola Marymount, UCLA, and oh yeah, Oklahoma uh, to start off. Uh, so you're, 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 you're going to know a lot, learn a lot early on. You have other marquee, but I'm curious, obviously Oklahoma, uh, you've played them before. You played them last year. They're, you're going to be playing them again down the road because right? they're going to be them in Texas are going to be joining the SEC in a few years, whenever that is. What was your reaction as, with realignment as that was unfolding? Um, you know, we knew it was going to happen. I just don't think we expected it to happen as quickly as it did. But we're really excited. You know, we pride ourselves in the SEC about being the strongest softball conference and adding those two schools is just going to make us even stronger. Um, you know, to have a team of Oklahoma's caliber. Um, and Texas and, you know, just the history of the university and the athletics in both of those schools is really exciting and something that we're looking forward to. It's, it's definitely going to be a challenge for all of us, but I think that's why we get into it. I know for myself, that's why I took the job is if you want to be the best. You got to compete against the best and learn from them. Um, and you to have that opportunity to see them, to work against them every year is going to be fun for us and just a fun, unique challenge, I think for everyone. But Really excited, especially personally. You know, I sent uh, Coach Gasso and JT both a message. Welcome to the SEC <laughs> when it happened. I don't know if they found it as funny as I did, but you know, I know we're looking forward to it. I'm excited for them, you know, to get to Starkville, um, and really also to get back to Norman as you know a conference program whenever that happens, and to take Mississippi State up there in their new stadium. I think is just going to be really special, and you know, that's really what it's about: is how can we continue to grow the game, and for them, I think joining the conference and all of the success and everything that coach Casso has done, you know, it's kind of about time that they're building that for her. So just as a, you know, former player of the program, it's going to be really special to go back and to see what all of her work and effort has done and is built there when that, when that new stadium is built. Um, so I'm looking forward to that just as an alumni, but then also the opportunity to compete against, you know, the best team in the country year after year is something that's only going to make us better. So we're looking forward to that as well. So are you going to be in charge of like co telling coach Gasso, Hey, here, this is where you take your team for, for to eat dinner in Starkville. Like I, I feel like she's going to be like, your phone's going to be blowing up. Whatever th that date is that they join, it comes closer. I feel like she's going to be blowing up your phone. Probably. I've already been talking with her director of operations. <laughs> um, she was, she was there when I was there. So I've known her for a while too, but yeah, we're excited. Um, you know, she tried to get us to come to Norman that week that our Tennessee series was canceled and we played them in Louisiana, but it's always fun. It's always, you know, just a different conversation when you're scheduling with them or trying to work something out because, you know, I've known her forever and, you know, she's really just been such a great influential leader for myself. And she really is, um, you know, someone I look up to. So when she calls and says, I need you to do X, Y, Z, you say, okay, how can I make it happen? <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I kind of do. <laughs> Have you coached at, at Oklahoma against her yet? Um, as an assistant, we went there, oh gosh, maybe 26, 15 or 16. What was that like? What was that like being in the other dugout? It was and different. I, was a bet. <laughs> yeah, it was a little different. Um, it had to have been 16 or seven because I know it was Paige Lowry, Paige Parker, so somewhere around then. Um, but yeah, I went up and I did the, uh, you know, the home plate meeting there, they announced something in front of all the fans there. So it was, and there's a lot of fans in the stands that I recognize and remember. So, you know, it's a special place when you've got that type of a fan base and that type of tradition. Um, so yeah, looking forward to going back to seeing everything there. And yeah, I'll be directing our director of ops where we're going when we're in Norman, just from everything I remember. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you know that place uh, inside out and you know people that know that place inside out the one thing i will never forget a couple of years ago kalani was on the ou staff 
Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, why are you not playing your sister? Like, this would be like that ideal. Is that something you both would avoid? Or is that something you would like kind of welcome? Like, I mean, I know she's not in coaching right now. She's still playing at a high level. But like, is that something that would ever, like, I, I wonder that because I interviewed her in Clearwater when Oklahoma was there. And I remember she was like, yeah, maybe when I'm done playing coaching, I'm thinking, well, if you're not on your, on you know, your sister's staff, would you face her? And that could have happened in theory that year when yeah. she was on the staff. Yeah, we would have loved to play them. I think it was just, you know, the schedules are done so far out in advance. Yeah. It's hard sometimes to plan that. Uh, but she's still in Norman, so she'll definitely be there. I'm going to have to give her a hard time about oh. what color she shows up in when we play there. Uh-oh. Yeah, that, yep. that, that could be a little awkward. Maybe. Yes. Is she gonna, maybe she could do like a split, one of those split shirts. She you might know? have to. My parents did that when we played Hawaii. Um, we did that. To, I got to play okay. Stephanie's team. In, in Hawaii and then Kehlani did when I was a GA and the split shirts and that was even weird for me being in the dugout as a GA when Kehlani was pitching against Stephanie in that game. <laughs> that's right that's pretty cool uh wow that's right so she's still in Norman how is she doing for those uh, fans obviously Kalani obviously was with Team USA there what what is she up to now do how's she doing overall? Yeah she's doing good she just got back actually from Japan um she played Gosh, this might have been her sixth season over in Japan. So just wrap that up. You know, she gets a little bit of a break before she picks softball back up again. Um, you know, their season starts later in the spring. Um, you know, so she's, I think, doing lessons, a lot of camps and everything, just kind of figuring out that next step. Um, but yeah, she's still involved. I think she's starting to learn a little bit. She's always said she really didn't want to coach, but I think the lessons is um, really been great for her and for her to get to work with young pitchers up to high school age and have to learn you know, for her, something that came so easy pitching, how does she articulate that and help coach the younger ones? And she's gotten really good at that. And I think for her, she had the opportunity to learn from coach Lombardi. And then when she was back on staff from coach Rocha, so she's kind of going through that same process of, you know, developing her style and testing and trial and error with what works. So it's been fun to listen to her and now the kind of the business side of it, she's trying to figure out how to operate camps and clinics and, you know, how should this work? What do I provide? All that. So she's learning the business side a little bit as well, which is always a neat learning curve for that age. I have to imagine either you or definitely, you know, Coach Gasso and that staff, they're probably like need, you know, kind of poking her and like, you know, come on, just join. Just go ahead and join the get it get in the coaching race. Come on. What are you what are you waiting for? Oh yeah. Yeah. She's <laughs> she's been hesitant this whole time. She just likes her lesson. So now she's more in the market of she'll get a picture and she'll call me about her and then she'll call Coach Gasso. Oh, and hold boy. on. Hold on, I get first dibs. <laughs> what happened to yeah? What happened to blood? You know, family. I, that's what I'm saying. But uh-huh. it's it's been fun to have her there, and um, you know, to really see her start to grow just in that journey for herself. That's amazing. Couple last things. A uh, couple rules. Instant replay. Obviously, the SEC as a league, you've always been in front of this. Uh, now more leagues will be able to do this, uh, which I think is good for the game. Your thoughts on that? And then the women's college world series schedule's been all uh, expanded. Uh, as well. And then the out of the box rule, uh, where now instead of an automatic out, it's a strike. Uh, any of those that kind of stands out to you uh, as far as those, uh, those news items? Yeah, I mean, I really like all of them. Um, you know, I know the instant replay we're going to use in regular season for SEC this year. Uh, we were supposed to last year, COVID kind of pushed everything a year for us, but we're excited for it. Um, you know, the adjustment to the schedule. You know, I think those two particularly are really just about the betterment of the game and the student athlete welfare. And if we're doing something, you know, on the baseball side, like the replay, why can't we be doing it for our athletes as well and get in, getting it right? You know, sometimes we see a close call that goes the wrong way towards the end of the game can make or, sh- make or break a win or a loss. So, you know, we're excited for that. And really, um, you know, the extra day and just taking care of the athletes, it was really tough to watch you know, and then to talk with coach Gasso and them and what they went through, especially, you know, going through that losers bracket, like they did, like Florida state did, and just playing the amount of games that they did in a short amount of time, when this is supposed to be, you know, the best of the best. And you're asking them to play at this elite level as the top last four teams standing with no rest, no recovery, no sleep. And, you know, that's, that's something that really, I think needed to be done. And I'm glad that you know, everyone was vocal about that and getting that change done quickly to take care of the student athletes and, you know, looking out for their health and well-being because it is, you know, all of us prioritize their sleep, their recovery, their well-being all throughout the season. And then you get to the biggest games of the year and suddenly they weren't 
you know, deemed as important. So I think that's huge. I think it's going to be really helpful uh, going forward for our game. Um, and then the out of the box rule as well. I just think, you know, the automatic out was just kind of a severe punishment that maybe didn't match the, the air, you know, the stepping over the line. So I think that'll be good. It really, I'd be interested to see how much it brings back slapping a little bit. Cause it seemed like it almost kind of took it away. Just, you know, slappers yeah. stopped slapping because they were constantly being called out of the box and they had to learn another tool. Um, so I think it'll be good. I hope I'm hopeful that it'll help kind of continue to lend softball to what it is, which is, you know, players of all different skills, sizes, shapes can be successful. You know, you can be small and fast, you can be big and strong. And there was a way that you could, you know, have a place in this game. And, you know, I hated to see slapping kind of go away with that role. So hopefully it kind of navigates that a little bit as well. Last thing, do you feel, do your players get kind of inspired by what baseball did winning the national championship uh, the, this past season, obviously, which was, you know, the big for the, the university volleyball just made their first ever NCAA tournament. It was one of the great stories, uh, in, in volleyball there, you know, football's doing well, men's basketball's doing well, all the sports there. Do you feel that the players feed off of that? The, the student athletes, there's something you guys all feed off each other there in, within that department there where on campus. Yeah, definitely. You know, we're pretty small athletic department. There's only 16, uh, varsity sports, which is the minimum amount you can have, which I think is great. You know, we really get the kind of small town, um, small athletic department type feel within a big time SEC environment. So all of our players, you know, we're not playing with 20, 30 different teams on campus. It's just 16. So they know all the other athletes, you know, they've, they're in study hall with them. They're in class, they're in tutoring. Um, I think that plays a big part in it. So, you know, our girls are at all the soccer games, just like they're at the football games and they're out supporting. Um, and we do a lot of things within the department. Uh, we've got a student athlete development uh, division that really kind of promotes that as well, where they get certain points and things for going to support other sports. But I think they would do it on their own as well. Um, you know, and to see volleyball really kind of take that turn and something that they've been working hard for, you know, they were really excited for the team. We're pumped for the staff. I know, you know, Julie Darty um, has really worked hard to get that team to where they're at. And then, yeah, I think baseball success, they've really been the storied program at Mississippi State for years, you know, even, um, you know, back to the days of Palmero and Clark, and that's what everybody knows Mississippi yeah. State for. So it's really fun to see them finally break through the one thing they hadn't done yet and to bring that trophy home. And I just think it couldn't happen to, to a better depart the department, the program with Coach Limonis um, and what he's done with his staff. And then to have, you know, the former coach, John Cohen, as our AD and to really kind of celebrate all together. I think it just kind of brought that family feel back um, and just reminded everyone why Starkville, why Mississippi State is so special. Um, you know, they held a whole parade through town when the baseball team came wow. back. That's an MLB type thing. Like, I don't think I've seen that in college, but it was oh. really special and really cool. And you know, that was right around the time that Mata came on her visit was about three days after the baseball team won and you know, coach Lamonis took the time to meet with her and talk with her and show her the trophy. And he didn't have to do that. I'm sure he was ready for a break, but to us, that's, that's why this university is special is he understood what a big, um, you know, recruit she was and he wants to help our program succeed just like his own. So to have people in our corner that aren't even, you know, coaching in our sport is always special. And you, you like when you have good people, you get to work around every day. And we definitely have that here. That's pretty wow, parade. That's pretty wild there. Uh, Quite the thing. <laughs> but that's what's great about and not and not only there at Mississippi State, but in a lot of places in the SEC, is there's that support for mm -hmm. the spring sports. It's not just a one sport school or two sport. There's everybody, and I'm sure that's one of the things that attracts you there is the passion and the support you have for baseball, softball there that you could win in both and all the other sports. Yeah, for sure, it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, that's one thing John Cohen talks about is kind of the smaller the town, the bigger your circle. And, you know, I think I really understand that now just after being here a few years, because you can't really go in anywhere, any store, any restaurant without seeing someone, you know, who knows you, you know, and same thing with our players where they're going to be like, Hey, Chloe, that was a great game last night. You know, it just makes them feel appreciated. And then those same people are out at our games. You know, we had, I think that was a big part of our success towards the end of the year, that Tennessee series um, and the Georgia series was the fan support that we had. And, you know, all the Bulldog fans that showed up and were loud and just really kind of influencing the game. And I think, you know, there's a lot of buzz around the athletic department around the softball program and player, you know, fans that want to support 
women's athletics as much as the men's. And that's fun. And that's something that we're working to build off as well. And because we know that's going to contribute to what we're doing on the field. You mentioned Clark and Palmero. They did a docu uh, series on SEC Network. It's Thunder and Lightning based on their baseball careers. Will Clark, by the way, was my favorite player of all time. So I might need your help, yeah. like get his autograph <laughs> or something. But we'll discuss that off the air. What? <laughs> Let your last question for your team. What's going to be the keys maybe to create your own thunder and lightning for this team and accomplish your eternal goals this year? Yeah, well, they were calling me and Fa uh, Thunder and Lightning 2.0 the last nice. few years. So we lost, I don't know which one was which, but we lost part of it. Um, <laughs> we had a, oh gosh, I don't know if you remember Kat Moore, but she used to walk around saying she was uh, Drizzle, is what she would call herself. <laughs> thunder, Lightning, and the Drizzle. But, uh, you know, I think. We've got half of it. We've got that power, Mia. I think if we can replace the output, um, offensive output that we lost with with Mata, with you know a couple of the others, you really I didn't even talk about the young ones, but Selena Daniels, a freshman, I think that's really going to be in there right away, um, and a couple others, maybe Riley Hull. But I think it's just you know continuing to to bring in players that want to to be in Starkville, to be at Mississippi State, and to help continue on with the impact that in the success we've had the last few years. And I think we're very excited about that. Um, but really it's just going to be continuing to push forward and not really, you know, let the setbacks or let the low points define us. And I think we were able to do that in 21. And, you know, our goal is to pick up from there and continue forward and to not, you know, continue, continue to kind of fall back. So I think, you know, we learned some good lessons there. Um, but really our goal is just to enjoy the game, enjoy each other and work hard in the meantime and just continuing to push forward in our player development and everything that we're doing on and off the field with them. Well, we look forward to seeing your team, your new faces and the, and the players returning up this upcoming season. I think everybody over there will be excited to see uh, coach Samantha Ricketts joining us here and in the circle. It's always a blast to talk to you. Always great to have you on. We still have it as a, a, a down the road. At some point, we're going to get all the Ricketts on the same show. We're going to figure that <laughs> out. We, the, the logistics are a little tricky. Everybody's busy being successful. They're busy being successful. So that's a very good excuse. But we'll do that down the road. But in the meantime, uh, thanks for taking the time. I know it's a busy time. Uh, happy holidays. And uh, we look forward to seeing you this season and uh, talking to you soon. Awesome, Eric. Thank you. I appreciate you having me.